Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms where I give you a heads up about upcoming shows and which date and time they will be aired. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the shows, MP3 files which you can download, or links to your favorite platform like iTunes, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and all other major sources. You can find information for upcoming and past talk show appearances as well as new book projects at MarlenePardo.com. You can also purchase books and merchandise there. And you can visit my author page on Amazon at Marlene Pardo Pelliser. Due to popular demand, I'm narrating my true believer stories that have collected throughout the years in a new series called Supernatural Storytime. You can find links at SupernaturalStoryTime.com. If you are into classic horror, ghosts, and adventure stories, I narrate some of those at Nightshade Diary. And you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If you would like to read noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. I do want to thank you all for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, this is Marley with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. How is everybody doing today? Fantastic, I hope. Well, I'm doing good especially because I have quite an excellent guest tonight. This is a gentleman that uh, I've interviewed before. He uh, has written several books. His name is Greg Lawson. And uh, Greg, um, like I said, has written fiction and nonfiction books concerning the paranormal. And one of the last books that is in the, it's been recently released and uh, as a matter of fact, we were talking a moment ago about how important this book is. Uh, is because it's one of a kind. It's it, the title of it is "Becoming a Paranormal Detective." But before we get into that, let me let me give you. I'm going to go over a little bit about as far as uh, Greg's uh, background and how important his background and his training is to this uh, latest uh, book that he's written. Now he he spent most of his adult life exploring strange places. Uh, he has a career law enforcement officer with over 26 years of experience, and he also served 10 years in various branches of the military. He's also worked as a mental health investigator uh, and is uh, investigating child abuse, sex crimes, and a homicide detective. He has a master's degree in education from Texas State University, uh, where he concentrated his studies in complex adaptive human systems, and he also specializes in investigative procedures. Uh, so he's uh, besides being an author, he's a lecturer. He has two fictional novels, though. He's got the Disorient Express and the Carry On, and uh, and of course, like I said, he his last book, Becoming a Paranormal Detective, is a nonfiction, which is explains something so important. And this is for this is for the serious ghost hunter, those who are truly truly serious about investigating and researching paranormal events and going where it leads as in sometimes there is nothing there and then of course recognizing when you do have a legitimate supernatural event on your hands but anyway how are you doing tonight Greg I'm doing very well thank you no thank you my pleasure for for having you on tonight I'm so excited because um, you know what so many times and we were talking about it uh, just a minute ago, the the thing with the paranormal investigations, so many people are running around out there, uh, not really knowing what to do, and some of them they know they're obl they don't they don't care that they don't know what they're doing, and then there's others out there that are trying their best, but I hate to say it, the examples that are given out there in a lot of the shows or even the books. They're far from accurate, absolutely far from accurate. Uh, right. I, I think you can kind of uh, break uh, the people that are interested in this type of paranormal activity into like three camps. 
Um, one is Ghost Hunter, which, yeah, the, beside the TV show, it's just, you know, like you're 16 years old and you all have some beer and, and you <laughs> yeah. want to run out to the, the, you know, the cemetery and see if you can yeah. find a ghost. That's, that's ghost hunting. And then you get the, right. the paranormal investigator that finds a, uh, some sort of legend uh, and then goes to the location and investigates, you know, the, the location based off of the legend. And then I'm, I'm trying to kind of spur everybody to uh, step it up uh, a notch and go okay. to be a paranormal researcher or what I call a paranormal detective, which, you know, most of your paranormal investigation is going to have to do with the interview and, and, and a, a establishing location and times and things like that. Sure. So that's, that's kind of, that's the kind of way I look at it. Anyway. Right. And I imagine also, especially, you know how some places, uh, I know it depends whether we're talking a residential or a historical landmark places that got a haunted reputation. I imagine sometimes also, uh, as far as starting with a clean slate, you know how certain places get a certain ghost or identity attached to the haunting. And sure. sometimes yeah. you gotta like put that aside because I'm sure in the research, sometimes you come up with information that either totally refutes what was, you know, what's been told and retold and retold for years and years, uh, or just brand right. new information, something that's was totally unknown. So it's like, yeah. even when some places uh, got a haunted reputation, I imagine the best thing is to think, okay, if I didn't know anything whatsoever about this place, now what? Right, and and I, I talk to people about this a lot, and their eyes kind of glaze over <laughs> whenever I bring it up. But I, I, I say everything you experience is in your head. Everything. Okay. Your your eyes are not the lenses to the world. They're nothing more than some you know some organs that pick up electromagnetic spectrum in the visual spectrum, and it turns into chemical and electrical responses that goes to the back of your brain. And then the back of your brain has to recreate what it thinks it sees. Right. So when you start throwing that stuff in there, you know, uh, caffeine can affect what sure. you, you think you see. You know, there, there's so many things that can affect what you think you see. So if you go to a location, um, like you said, some of these locations, let, let, let's say Gettysburg. What are you going to mm -hmm. see in Gettysburg? You're expecting to see a soldier because oh, sure. you've whole, heard so many stories about, you know, you can see the soldiers coming out of the fog and this and that. And so, you know, it, it, is that what you saw or is that something that's in your head or are we looking at a, a time shift and, and or, a, you know, a residual haunting or a psychic impression? I mean, we can just go on and on. But, you know, you go to the Pyramids of Giza, you expect that you're going to see something right. on. Lizzie Bordenhouse, you're going to expect. To, to have some sort of experience. So it's it's very difficult to try to cleanse yourself of that when you go to one of these famous places or these places, like you said, that already has a reputation. Right, you're primed, you're primed. And if you think about, let's say that first example that you gave Gettysburg, okay, yes, of course, Gettysburg, you know, you had thousands of deaths basically compressed into 72 hours. But then again, there was other things that took place before and after the Gettysburg, which in and of itself, it does, like you said, people and everybody describes soldiers or uh, if they hear something, it's gunshots or cannon, you know, cannon fire. Right. Yeah. It, and, you know, the interesting thing is, is if you look at uh, some of the hospitals, um, uh, some, some of the psychiatric hospitals that are out there that are famous places and some people will go in and see orbs. Some people will go in and see, you know, do an experiment with a, a little child's toy and the toy rolls around on the floor or, or you know, the, at the same place they'll see, a, a, you know, an apparition or whatever. So it's kind of interesting on how different people that show up at the same location mm -hmm. are experiencing different phenomena. Right. Exactly. You know, because if it... it, it it, I, I don't have any explanation for it. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, uh, it's, it's just odd. It's weird. And um, I myself, uh, the first time I went to Gettysburg, 
I stayed. And of course, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, like just like a jury pool. How do you keep people from not having been contaminated by the news? Same thing. You know, when you go oh, to yeah. Gettysburg, how yep. can you not have heard all the stories besides the historical information? But I went and I stayed in a very small motel that was right across the street from the uh, the Union Cemetery. And uh, we rolled in there really late at night. So basically, we just got the keys and just went to our room. And I remember I had really a lot of disturbing dreams. And believe it or not, I had the weirdest dreams going on with somebody that used to clean, like a cleaning lady, of all things, of all things, <laughs> of all things. And uh, my husband, he... He was, by the way, he would not make fun of me, but he was always like more of the skeptic. And I remember him trying to wake me up, telling me, hey, I'm hearing noises in the bathroom. And I was thinking he was giving me grief, you know? And I was like, ah. Right. So the next morning, he's upset at me. Like, and I'm like, what's wrong? He goes, I was trying to tell you, I'm hearing noises in the bathroom. And I'm like, but I thought you were kidding me. And he was serious. It winked him out totally. So he goes and he goes, I said, uh, I forget, go to the office and do something. He comes back and he goes, guess what? Our room is supposed to be one of the most haunted. And I go, really? For what? He goes, <laughs> and it was something about that. Something had happened to a lady that used to work there like back in the 1980s that used to clean. And I was like, are you kidding me? But again, like what you said, the expectations that you get about Gettysburg, as an example, you always think soldiers, uh, or if you're in proximity to the one of you know one of the places that served as a hospital, uh, things like right. that. So, and my point being that sometimes you do have experiences which have totally nothing whatsoever to do with what's out there, you know, in the mass consciousness or the stories that are given out about certain places, especially if they're like a historical location, like Gettysburg. But um, in some cases, I know it's very difficult to to say, OK, I'm going to put what I know about this location aside and not investigate thinking, OK, this is what I'm going to experience or this is what I might see. Or if you're doing any type of, you know, voice phenomena, this is what I'm expecting. I want to capture. I mean, Always what you hear is a lot of reenactors having experiences uh, or people in the park. And it always has to do with uh, with the, the war, the, the battle that took place there in July. You know, the three day uh, uh, battle that took uh, place in July. What was it? 1863. And there was a lot of other stuff that happened afterwards in that area after. After that battle. Right. Yeah. So let me so, ask. Yeah, I'm sorry. It, go ahead. No, it just it's 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 that's that's where I get to the point of, of you know what what is the explanation of what we're doing? And you, you said your your husband's uh, more of a skeptic. Well, I've always said that if you're well, I haven't always said this is absolutely true. Other people have said it too. If you're an investigator, you have to be a skeptic. Yes. If you there's a continuum of of you know you're either gullible or you're cynical mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle is skeptic and they float back and forth based on the amount of evidence and experience that they have dealing with something so you know it's, it's hard to sit back and, and see if it, events can be explained by conventional means you know like i have right. people all the time that whenever i'm doing conventions i have them come up to my my table all the time and they they want to show me their orb photos yeah and I look at them, I'm like, okay, this, yeah, um, I don't, they're like, well, what do you think it is? I'm like, I have no clue. Dust. I wasn't there, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, uh, I know, I, I know, but it's your, like, yeah. yeah. I can look at your photo and tell you that um, I can get orbs like that very easily because of the way that digital photography works. And, you know, we didn't get that when we had, you know, when we were just using film, mm -hmm. uh, you would get streaks. You can sometimes get orbs. Um, uh, but not like with digital photos. Digital photos get orbs like crazy, and it's because of the, you know, j just the way that the digital medium works. And so, I, I don't know how. I don't. I don't want to 
I don't want to say orbs aren't important in digital photos um, because obviously some of them are very unusual, especially the ones that are, seem to be giving off light right. uh, in the photo. But, you know, I can go by and bump a, um, you know, um, a, a, anything that has a little bit of dust on it, wait a few seconds and take a, pic, a flash picture, and I'm going to have orbs all over the place. I, I got an orb. We were in uh, Ireland at Lep Castle, and I, I, told, I asked my wife, she would take a picture of me in the Bloody Chapel. Okay. So I, I stood over on one side. She took the picture, and we didn't look at it until we got home. And there were 400 orbs all around me, right. man, and it looked really cool. But yes. Left Castle in, in the Bloody Chapel is one of the most, um, you know, dusty places on the planet. So it wouldn't, it let, didn't surprise me that. Let me ask you, and, I, I, and I'm going to, since you brought up Left Castle, I mean, I've always heard, especially about that elemental that's there. Did right. you experience anything along that? That that right there was like, God, that's that's pretty horrific. So there were a lot of people there when I was there. We probably there was probably twenty people mm -hmm. um, because you know it, it's open. You can just drive up there, okay, uh, and go. You you park outside. You walk through the gate. You go knock on the door. Uh, and, you know, from the the owner. The way that the taxes work out, he gets a tax break by allowing people to walk through his house. Uh, okay, so that, that's a good reason. The owner just goes, I know, the owner just goes, yeah, can you hold on just a second, let me put my underwear away or whatever he's doing. <laughs> and he goes and does that and then he opens up his house. He goes, yeah, you can go wherever you want to go, do whatever you want, you know. And so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. He's a, he's, a, he's a neat guy. And uh, so I, I did not experience anything, but I took a picture on my way out of there. Okay. And once again, I, I have, I, w I was in uh, Transylvania six years ago or something like that. Okay. And I still have not made it through the video that I, the, all the video that I recorded when I was in Transylvania. Okay. So sometimes it takes me a while to get sure. through my stuff. It's, it's time consuming. Um, it, it really is. And so, yeah, I'm sitting there looking through some stuff. I took a, a picture of the front of Lep Castle, and it was crazy. And he, you know, a, a skeptic's going to step in and say, it's pareidolia. You know, it's just some reflections off the window. Mm -hmm. But there, you'd have to see the photo. Uh, I'm taking a picture of the front of the castle, the front doors. The owner and his wife are standing out right in front of the door. There's a huge window above them, and a it looks like a bishop, really? like some sort of priest is standing in the window. It's fantastic. Wow. And 10 minutes prior to that, I walked down the hallway past that window and came outside and everybody was outside and, and we took some, some group photos and, and I walked back probably, I don't know, 50 yards from the place, took the picture, turned around, got on the bus and left. <laughs> and, and later saw this, I was like, oh my yeah. God, that's great. Right. It's one of my favorite photos I've ever taken, and so yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I didn't really experience anything there other than that photo. And the photo is fantastic. It's one of my favorites. Right, and and you know what? And that doesn't mean really that there's nothing there, but it's like I say, it's supernatural is not a non-demand thing, especially when you've got a right. bunch of people running around, uh, you know, <laughs> being tourists. Right. Um, and I imagine you were only there for X amount of time. Uh, Yep. So, yeah, I, I, I totally understand. And, and I know the owners have said that they've had their experiences and they've kind of like, and uh, let's face it, he, he's, uh, he's got a motivation also to, you know, keep that haunting uh, reputation going because he's getting a sure. tax break for <laughs> all the tourists yeah. that he, uh, he allows to basically, I guess it drives tourism for them, you know. So I'm not saying there isn't anything right. there and I've read up on it. On what was supposedly there and god knows there's enough horrific you know deaths that occurred there that you would think definitely it's haunted but well yeah if there's a formula yeah to make a haunting it would yeah, definitely it be, would there. be there yeah medieval times families killing yeah, family people, members people, people culture people life was cheap i mean it was like god yeah Throwing them in the wall of the of the castle and and just sealing them up. Yeah, in the they mirrored people. Castle. That was one of those things that. It's just God. amazing. Or they yeah. would throw. I don't know if they had. Uh, do they have a new? Did they have a new bullet there? I don't know. I always get my castles mixed up. No. Where they would just pitch you no, in there that, and 
you would just like slowly starve to death if that is if the fall didn't yeah. kill you. But anyway, let me Warwick. let me get back to the book. Warwick. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Okay. No, Warwick Castle over in uh, England, over in uh, uh, Warwick, uh, England. They have the there. They have the that is there. Just, okay. Oh my God, it's terrible. No, I mean it's when you look, I, when you think about it, I mean. It was like, what yeah. is it? Life was cheaper. Everybody had to be a psycho sociopath to exist because it's like, yeah. you know, you're eating dinner and, uh, you know, maybe over two rooms over, you know, you've got people groaning, going, help. You know, oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could tell. <laughs> yeah, that when I when I got down in that thing, um, the, the hatch to get in it is probably, I don't know, um, 16 inches wide by 16 really? inches wide. And I'm I'm kind of a big guy. I mean, I'm I'm six two and weigh two twenty between two ten and two twenty. Uh -huh. And for me to get down there, I had to wiggle my way down in there. And then once you get in there, uh, it was probably six or eight feet long, or maybe four feet wide, and and they God. would just stuff people in there. That's and crazy. as they starved to death and died, then they would scream, hey, "Get him out of here!" You know. And finally. Whenever they felt like it, they'd go over there and pull the dead guys out of there. But you know, it's just, it's just let me tell you something. I just mind-boggling. I, I, I what human beings do to each other. Yeah, it's and this amazing. was and and you know what? And kind of horrific part is it wasn't like okay, like one you know lord or one castle was the one that did this. This was kind of common, in, yeah. you know, during these times, especially yeah. if there were sieges and wars, and it was like that was the. Everybody did that, I guess, for lack of a better yep. word. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Some of these places, but then I'm thinking, man, that's a long time to hang out as a ghost. Nobody set you free. But I imagine also that they might have, if you want to call it, for lack of a better word, the residual, the imprint there, which I imagine, talk about intense emotional agony. I mean, God. Right. And uh, I, I, I can tell by what you said that you're not claustrophobic then, huh? Uh, not typically. <laughs> um, I, I, I can be, you know, because I'm, I'm a, I'm, I, I, I supervise a, a group of guys that do lake patrol. Okay. And I'm a, the supervisor for our underwater recovery team. So we do a lot of diving in Lake Travis, and it's it's very murky, and you know you can't see very much, and um, it. Most divers don't care for it too much. We, we have a lot of people uh, in our agency, and we have very, very few divers just because of what you said. You know, it, can be, it can be very claustrophobic. And, uh, but you know what? So, I, I, you described that, and I'm good, but when you were talking about that Ubele at the dimensions, I'm not claustrophobic, not really, but I was like, oh, oh. I was having a hard time there. Oh, yeah. Even though I understand oh, what yeah. you're saying as far as the diving in the murky water and I, I guess what the the visibility, what is it? Is it just that it's very muddy or what? It, it just depends uh, on the time of the year and stuff. Sometimes you'll have six inches of visibility. Sometimes you'll have three feet and very, very rare times you'll have, uh, you know, 15, 20 feet. But yeah. And Greg, so what, do they, what do they die for? Water. Usually what, uh, recovery of evidence or bodies or what? Body, bodies, yeah, drowning victims. Yeah. Okay. okay. We, we do that a lot more than evidence, uh, but we do die for evidence also. Wow, yeah, yeah, you gotta have, yeah. you, got, you gotta wanna do that, I guess. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't see, it's like, oh. Yeah, no, definitely, the, the not, not everybody uh, is suited to, to to do that thing with a diving, but let me ask well, there's, you. There's very, there's very few um, people out there that specialize in aquatic death investigation. You know, they, they're, there's probably uh, eight people in the whole United States that really specialize in that. Really? And because it, yeah, it, it is a very unusual medium, uh, you know, as far as death goes to, to investigate it. And, and that's one of those things about being an investigator, whether, whether you're an insurance fraud investigator, or you're mm -hmm. a homicide investigator, you know, that there's certain traits that you need to have, um, you know, uh, unregulated suspicion. You have to have suspicion about everybody. You know, you don't want to have suspicion about the husband of the de dead 
you know, mm -hmm. woman, the dead victim. Um, but to not have him as a suspect would be a disservice to her and her family and everybody else. Because Absolutely. typically, if you, if you, like we were talking about, if we were going to have a formula for a haunting, we'll have a formula for a murder. It's a family member. It's not a stranger. Yeah. The old stranger danger thing is, is, it doesn't match up. It is family, friends, accomplice, you know. Somebody people, or people somebody in the know. circle that's yeah. of that person's life that's known. Uh, right. Or... So in, in, in any kind of investigation, you know, you, morbid curiosity, you have to have that. You have to have keen observations, skilled communications, you know, deductive reasoning, sometimes inductive. I mean, there's, there's so many traits that are important when you're, uh, uh, you know, a true investigator. Let me ask you something, Greg. Just, let's you know, let's say when you said that thing about people that investigate aquatic deaths, I imagine let's say you recover a body, it goes to the medical examiner, and the medical examiner determines cause of death. And where do they take right. over if it's determined that the person died as a result of drowning? Because you know sometimes if you're dead and they dump your body, obviously they could tell, you know, this person right. wasn't, you know, they were dumped. In other words, they were already dead. Uh, yeah. That's a, that I didn't know that 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 was such a field that was such a small number of people and what what is it oh, yeah. do they investigate once it's determined that this person was drowned or thrown in there or well you know just the circumstances they'll uh, okay. um kind of leads up to where the investigation is going to go okay but but yeah it's, it's and it's just like dealing with paranormal investigations mm -hmm. uh, it kind of depends on where you know what's going on. What what are the circumstances leading up to a haunting? Okay. Uh, you know, because most of the time it's so unusual for. I mean, we we've had some pretty horrific stuff happen around in our area, okay. uh, and we don't have any ghosts of these people. Right. It seems like you know most of the ghosts that we have are, you know, fifty, a hundred years, hundred and fifty years old oh, okay. incidents it's that happen. And uh, you know, but it, yeah. Come on, and 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 you're you're going right into the. When I see all these shows, it's you know, and it's like okay, I there somebody who's producing the show is saying we don't want to get sued, so let's talk about somebody that got killed, a hundred years ago. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know because and, yeah, and, and 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 it makes you wonder. It's like all right, well, um, you know, do, does the haunting happen right away, or does it take a while for the ghost or the spirit or, or the entity or whatever it is, uh, um, you know, to manifest itself. Um, I don't know, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Let me ask you something, Greg, because I, I was looking that the first part of the book is the investigation itself. And this has to mm -hmm. do with what is it between a residential versus a historic? What, what the briefly does that entail as far as, that being the first step, let's say, for somebody that's going to be doing an investigation? Um, so, the, the, let me, let me see if I can uh, make the, make sense out of this. <laughs> uh, right. If, uh, you know, are you investigating a person? Are you investigating an event? Are you investigating a location? Are you investigating a legend? Each one of these things okay. um, all kind of have a focus of their own. But in your investigation, you have to investigate all of that. Okay. But but typically when people go in, they, it's like, oh, I heard this. There's this, you know, legend about this uh um, you know, you drive your car up on the, the, the railroad tracks in San Antonio right. and put talcum powder on the back of your trunk. And, it, you know, the, the little ghost kids that were in the, in the bus that got hit by the train right. will come and, yeah, and, uh, right. and, and push your car out. Um, so there, there's more to it than that when you start doing the investigation because people will go, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. So they go out there. And they look around, they take the EMF readers out, and they take their video and audio, and they're out doing all that stuff. Um, yeah. And then they find out, wow, there was never a bus full of kids that were killed. Right, right. Stuff. That's another thing, that when you start doing the research, 
I mean, you know, sometimes I know that stories can kind of get a little bit twisted, like the facts, but sometimes you do the research and there's like nothing there, especially something like right. what you were describing that thing in San Antonio, which uh, research wise is kind of recent in the sense of, you know, it was a school bus thing, I believe. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's like, yeah. And I believe also they did like the, uh, you know, where basically despite that it looks like the the actual, actually it's instead of going up the the road slants down or something like that i know it's like that's deceiving right, when right. you look yeah. at it versus the actual it, it, tilt of the road that's right yeah because the, the train tracks are are in a at a certain attitude and the roads at a different attitude it makes it look like it's level but uh, it's not exactly and you know i've been down there a couple of times and it's it's fun to go look and look at people go well, you're just a debunker. No, man, it's not no, paranormal. I... It's not paranormal. There's nothing here that would say, you know, that that's going to back your story of all these kids being killed here. It didn't exactly. happen. Exactly. Exactly. So. And this is the thing. And and and, you know, for all those people that are like, oh, you're raining on the parade on our paranormal parade thing, like. And, and I get it because it's fun if you think about it, especially if you're a teenager, let's go out there or whatever. But I'm thinking to myself, and especially, and I'm sure you, 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 you understand where I'm going to come from, for all of these well-known urban legend, paranormal, sometimes have a little bit of truth in them. There's a ton of people that were killed, murdered, horrific things that were never documented, never made the newspapers that could generate a haunting at a certain location and you would never find it by researching it doesn't mean it doesn't exist per se it's just that uh, I mean I'd rather know the truth I mean it's fun but I would rather know the truth like what you were saying that there was no incident which something like that would have made the papers you know if kids were killed in a, in a you know school bus accident hit by a train and and then of course when they do the I guess the equivalent of a surveying, a surveyor's thing, which shows that the road is not really angled the way it it looks. But right. uh, there's there's plenty of places that are haunted, whether residual or intelligent, that might be totally, how can I say, unknown, for lack of a better right. word. So one of the first top books I ever read was called uh, The Corpse Had a Familiar Face. Uh, and that was written by um, a reporter in the Miami Chronicle. Okay. For the, or I guess, it's, is, it, is that the major paper in Miami? It was the Miami Chronicle? News, which is now defunct, and the Miami Herald is what's been, what's okay. survived, yeah. Maybe it was the Miami Herald. And this would have been in uh, 1981, 82, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was probably the Herald, yeah. Yeah. So one of the reporters was a, uh, uh, you know, the police beat reporter. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that year that she wrote this book, there were over 700 murders in Miami. Yeah, those this were the been days the, in uh, Miami. <laughs> yeah, the, the Cuban uh, boat oh. uh, crisis and all that stuff. Yep. And it was crazy. So, you know, you sit there and go, wow, 700 people within the city limits of Miami. Mm-hmm. That's crazy amount of people killed, yes, right? Yes. Um, do we have ghost legends of these recent things? We have, a, there's a few, but you know, you'd think, wow, you know, there's, some of these people were killed horrifically. Yeah. Look at what's going on in Mexico yes. along the border now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, the, the amount of abductions and murders that are going on with all the drug trafficking down there it's, is it's, just it's staggering. That, that, that they dismember people and leave the bodies like in the middle of the road. Yeah. It, that's horrific. Yeah, and it's not just a few. I want to say Mexico had 70,000 murders mm -hmm. in, in 20, 2015, 2017, something like that. Um, and a, a bunch of those are you know, they try to cover them up. So you can't get really good numbers out of there. Right. Those are the ones that have but, been found or I guess discovered yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and like you said, it's not like they just went up and shot them in the head and dumped them on the side of the road. No, they do horrific yes, they things do. to these people. And then they do horrific 
things to the bodies. Yes. Because they're trying to make a statement so nobody else will go against that. Yes, psychological you know? warfare. Incredible. Yes. Incredible stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, it, yeah. It's, it's, it, and those are the ones like that that example that you gave about Miami during the 80s because I was born and raised in Miami so <laughs> I I saw everything that happened as far as the 70s and 80s uh, and yeah. those are the ones that were discovered believe me there's you hear countless stories of people disappearing the if the Everglades could talk <laughs> wow <You're right. laughs> yeah all right yeah yeah you know and, and so you know is it the location is it the manner of death that spurs a, a ghost story is it uh, lo, you know is it love what is it you know and, and you said something that i think is very true is um in myth in legend there are truths to it mm -hmm. uh, it might not be the exact historical account of what happened right but the truth is still there whether it be you know um i i and there, there's a great, my favorite ghost story, sort of, is uh, um, uh, Charles Fort in Kinsale, Ireland. And the, the commander of the fort was Irish, and he, they had been taken over by the British, and they had British officers there at the fort, but the Irish were, at this point, uh, uh, working with the British. And this this commander, his name was Warren. Her last his last name was Warrender. Um, he had a daughter named Wilful, and that's actually a popular name back in the 1700s was Wilful. Okay. And so uh, she fell in love with one of the uh, the British officers, which is a little bit you know controversial. Mm -hmm. And his name was Trevor Amherst. And the, the commander said, you know what, she, I want her to be happy, and, and okay, I'm going to bless this union. And so they got married, and it was a huge deal. This is all documented. It was a huge deal at uh, Charles Fort, and they had the wedding, and they had a big party, and I'm sure they were very intoxicated. Uh, and then at the end of the, the wedding, they went to the, the bridal suite, and on the way there, he realized that she didn't have a bouquet. And there were some, her favorite flowers were growing out of the outside wall on the ramparts. So he reaches over and almost falls and she's grabbing him and, she, you know, they're laughing. And there was a guard standing there and he said, sir, if you take my post, I will go get those flowers for you. And he said, sure. So he takes the guy's rifle. Um, the kid takes off. I'm, I'm assuming he's a kid. A young, young guy takes off and he goes down to get these flowers out on the wall. Well, he doesn't come back. And so they wait and they wait and they wait. And, and Trevor says, uh, Wolf, will just go back to the bridal suite. As soon as I get relieved, I'll come join you. And so she takes off. Well, he sits down. He's been drinking too much. He sits down and he falls asleep. Well, that evening, the commander, you know, shortly after uh, the wedding, he decides to do a, uh, you know, a, a walk of the perimeter, check all the guards, and he comes up on this guard that's sitting there asleep. So he pulls out his pistol and he shoots it. Oh. The guy falls over. Everybody runs over there. The commotion, you know, the, the commander's given orders to drag the corpse over and put it on the grinder over there. They roll him over and he finds out that it's his son-in-law, his oh. new son-in-law. Yeah, and Willful comes running out. And this is where it gets a little bit weird, where the story kind of branches uh, but uh, she sees that he's dead, so she jumps over the rampart and kills herself. And then the, you know, the commander goes back to his office, writes his transfer order, and shoots himself in the head. So now we got three, three dead people in this situation. Okay. Well, despite, despite whether we got all the, um, the actions correct, you know, whether, mm -hmm. whether he shot the kid and then his daughter ran out and he, you know, was beside himself and shot himself right there. And then she jumped over the wall or whatever. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is um, don't be hasty with your actions. <laughs> you know, yeah. before you shoot somebody, make sure you're shooting the right guy or exactly. for the right reason or whatever. You know, don't, don't. So there are truths to all of these legends and all of these myths 
you just have to search for what is your truth in it. Um, so anyway. Well, no, That's and you know what? Nice. You said something really interesting earlier, Greg, which is a lot of people don't realize. Your perception is your reality. And by this, I mean, everybody's different. What seems important to one person, monumentally important, is like what? Uh, and so I guess it, like what you were asking, like what, what, what makes up a haunting or what could cause a human spirit to be earthbound, whether by choice or confusion, whatever. Uh, and you sometimes you hear about certain things that you would think, you mean that person's haunting because of that? But maybe to this person, this was monumentally important. And, and, and I guess my point is that we always think of ghost stories being attached only to tragedies, as in evident right. tragedies. Yeah. Either war yeah. or what you described, uh, you know, just crossed, uh, you know, star-crossed lovers and then, you know, all these. But you can have a personality who something happened to them at the time of their death, things were undone, unleft or sudden, which are not that uh, extreme, I guess is what I'm saying. And they could still be earthbound. Right. And then you could have somebody, yep. let's say like a soldier, if you're going into war, let's face it, you kind of understand that you might die. If, you understand what I'm saying? As far as mentally or psychologically oh, yeah. prepared for it, not that you want to, but you know, you, you kind of understand that that is the risk of what you're doing. Uh, sure. Yeah. So it's almost like, um, or depending also on what you're doing. What we were talking about as far as, let's say, uh, with, with Miami, when all these people were running around selling drugs and life was cheap and, you know, anybody could kill you for whatever reason over a turf war. Uh, you know, they want to take your drugs and or your money. A lot of these people that were involved in this, they knew they were living on the razor's edge. I'm saying as far as being ghosts, you know, nobody wants to die, especially if it was horrific. But you kind of knew that it came with what you were doing. All right. So right. Uh, sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes tragedies happen and you understand, wow, that's a good reason why somebody would be haunting or that there's a haunting involved in it. But sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be that in our eyes, in our perception, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, and right. by this, I mean, um, let's say 100 years ago. You know, your reputation was everything. You know, people uh, people would commit suicide over things that we would think you're killing yourself over that. You know, loss of prestige, loss of money, men especially if, uh, if they lost their honor, uh, things of this nature that now today we would never think like you're going to kill yourself over that. But back then those things were really, really important. Uh, and people would kill themselves over it. Same thing with a woman. If she yeah. was dishonored, if, you know, if she, her reputation got, you know, she lost her reputation. Well, and also like what you just described right now, where everybody just killed themselves because, well, which seems pretty awful. Don't get me wrong. That, that even now today, that would be a horrible scenario if it played out. But uh, sometimes as far as if we look at the psychological motivation for what we think would produce a haunting we can't always think of always the extreme for being the uh the the reason for it it sounds a lot more oh, i want to i don't want to say romanticize it but not necessarily always and um let me ask you and, and you and you made reference to it earlier as far as let's say when you do an investigation in, in modern crime that you're saying okay you know when i I'm going to look at everybody involved in, around this victim. Even the people that you would think would not want to do this. Have you ever come across uh, somebody killing somebody else for what in maybe not that good a reason? I guess that's what I'm thinking of. Plenty. Yep. Okay. Yep. In other words, it wasn't love or vengeance or, you know, one of those horrible or money, you know, that you think, man, you killed this and person over this. Stupidity. Yeah. yeah. And it's complete stupidity and mm -hmm. um, just not thinking through it, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and now let me ask you something. Let's say, let's say you, you start your investigation and you, you were mentioning something really important earlier to me, which was the interview. 
Okay, because you also explained to the would-be uh, paranormal investigator how important that is, depending, I guess, of course, of what, you know, if it's a historical, if you're interviewing, I guess, what people that work there, or is it if it's a private residence, uh, as far as interviewing people that live there, you explain to them how to do the interview? Yeah, um, so I, I go through the different things because, you know, you have, you have an interview, you have an uh, interrogation, you have cross-examination. So okay. um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the difference, you know, a lot of people, can, if I say that, they kind of have an idea of what it is in their head, but there's also a formula on how to use that because um, if you come hardcore into somebody for something, right. It's going to be hard to repair the damage that you do when you insult them. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. so yeah. the idea is, you know, first you just sit back and go, so I, you know, so what happened? And you just let them tell their story from beginning to end. You shut up and let them talk. And that's, that's one of the number one things that uh, uh, paranormal investigators can't do. Yeah. They can't just shut their damn trap and listen to the story. They'll yeah. add in stuff and everything else. So, um, you know, what it ends up looking like, it looks, it makes it look like they're coaching them or they're, you know, they're, they're steering them in a particular direction uh, and putting words in the person's mouth instead of just shut up, let them tell their story from beginning to end, then interview that story. Okay. And then you go back in and you say, okay, uh, let me make sure I get this clear, clear, you know, whatever the confusion was. A lot of people don't tell a story in a chronological uh, order. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of go back in and, and make sure that you're really clear about the chronology of how this phenomena happened or incident happened or whatever it is. Right. And once you get that down, then you can kind of go back in and pick apart what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. In, in, in other words, uh, you know, if if there if twenty people are experiencing twenty different phenomena at a location, well, what does that tell us? Now, if twenty people are experiencing a full-on apparition that walks into the hallway and then walks over to the stairway and disappears at the stairway then that would go along with this particular, um, you know, legend of a woman that walked up to the stairway and hung herself there. Okay, I can, I can match that. But when you have, you know, Waverly Hills is a perfect example. They got so much stuff going on there. Uh, it's got to be some sort of crazy vortex, you know. Right. Uh, uh, but then you think of all the portal, human traffic. Yeah, yeah. And let's face yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it just kind of depends. And so... You, you go through the, like I said, you let them tell their story. You go back through it as an interview, trying to get specific things out of it. And, and then you go back in and you do a little, little bit of a, uh, uh, an interrogation if there's certain things that don't fit or, or let's say a cross-examination of certain things that don't, don't fit. And you try to leave your interrogation for the people that you um, – find out that they are truly hoaxers and they're just full of crap right uh and and they're waste completely wasting your time because i will dig off into somebody that wastes my time like that and there are a lot of people that do that like the the yogurt shop murders that happened here um or that happened in austin um 42 people came forward and, and admitted to killing those girls what is that all about? I, 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 I just, I, you know what? I, this is the thing because you know when those murders, you know, you always have the the, the wackadoos that 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 yeah. say it was me. But do you think those are usually a couple? But that's a lot. That's no, a lot of people. That's a lot. Yeah, uh, and you know the John Benet Ramsey, all the people that came forward on that. Oh, the the, the one real famous knucklehead that came forward that was in Thailand, I, whose name I won't mention. But you know, just absolutely insanity so you know i always kind of shrug my shoulders when i have uh, uh ghost hunters that call me a uh, um, a debunker or he's like oh you're just you know man if you had any idea how much people lie about this kind of stuff i mean even even uh, 
I, I get contacted by like bar owners or uh, hotel owners and stuff. They want me to come over there and, and basically certify that oh, their place yeah. is home, you know, yes, yes. and, and maybe some of them are, maybe some of them are, but when somebody approaches me from a marketing standpoint, I'm like, you know, uh, you can, there's a hundred ghost groups out there that will come in and say this place is haunted. Why don't you just go ahead and talk to them? About right. It? Exactly. Uh, exactly. And we were talking but, you know, about it, that, that now that's, that's a, uh, something that happened in the last maybe 10 or 15 years where it's yeah. uh like you said a marketing ploy before i'm not gonna say it didn't happen but uh I think, it wasn't as prevalent no. to about the last 15 years probably no as a matter of fact a yeah. lot of businesses would run in the other direction some of them had legitimate stuff going on and they would right. they would tell employees you're going to get fired yeah if you talk about this yeah uh, yeah, they did and, not want that type of uh, association for their business, or even hotels, right. stuff like that. Uh, well, we had that, you know, that air, uh, the Eastern, well, the now defunct Eastern Airlines, you know, when it had the plane that went down here in the Everglades, and uh, they took some of the equipment off the plane because in uh, not it was a huge loss of life, but not everybody died. And then I'm sure you've heard the stories that. Um, several people would see the dead pilots in the airplanes where some of the equipment had been reused. And um, the Eastern Airlines was telling their employees that they would get in big trouble if they talked about that. They were not allowed wow. to say anything whatsoever about, you know, what everybody was talking about, you know, <clears throat> when you work someplace, yeah. because the airlines didn't want that running rampant Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, it, 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 this, it was not always the thing that people wanted for their businesses, but now things have changed right. a lot. And, and when, when you get called in or you end up interviewing people, you know, there's a lot of people that, um, you know, let, let's say, let's say they're, um, they heard about something or they experienced something, but they're a real skeptic, mm -hmm. serious skeptic, almost cynic. Yes. And they're like, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. So, you know, that would be considered a reluctant witness. There's a lot of reluctant witnesses when they witness a crime. Well, they don't want to come forward because they're afraid of retaliation sure. from the suspect. But re there's reluctant witnesses in paranormal all the time. Like you said, you know, the, the guy that experiences something and it was pretty profound to him. And he wants to tell somebody, but his boss is saying, you better not. I'll fire you. You'll get in trouble. You know, and, and then you have the unaware witnesses that uh, people experience something, but they just really didn't pay much attention to it or don't believe or whatever. Right. And they just think, oh, well, that's just, you know, there was a flash in my eye or, you know, um, something must have brushed against me. It's not a big deal. And they just don't pay attention to it. So there's techniques on how to, uh, you know, get the, the, the reluctant witness to actually come forward and actually talk about it. And a lot of times that means that, you know, it has to be anonymous. And of course, then they have to trust that you will keep it anonymous and they won't get in trouble for it. And the same thing with the unaware witness is there's, there's certain, um, it, you can, you can do some, uh, not, it's almost like hypnosis, but regression therapy kind of stuff. And you bring the person back to, uh, the situation where they experience whatever the phenomenon is, phenomena is, and you take them through that, that way. And sometimes you will get, you know, more information that way, but that, that can also fall right back into the coaching thing. You know, you have to be really careful and, and pretty skilled. There's, there's actually a certification for police hyp hyp hypnosis. And uh, it just, and it's not about making anybody, do anything weird it's just about creating an atmosphere where the person can relax and, and really reflect back on what happened and uh, in a way that you talk them through it like i said it's it's like regressive therapy that that psychiatrists or psychologists well, will do i'm a trained hypnotherapist uh, and i've hypnotized a lot okay. of people and you're okay. absolutely right you know it, it depends on the person's adjustability um yep. how deep you make them go and of course you're you 
have to ask a certain way where you're not giving them an expected result that you're looking for or an answer in other words right right and let them go and it, a lot of times people uh, especially when you're talking either recovery memories uh depends if there's any trauma associated with it you know because some people you know trauma will do that to you or depends how long ago but uh yeah it, 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 there's there's ways to ask it and sometimes you have to do it more than once to relax the person and where they realize they're not going to go off to never never land <laughs> because you'd be surprised what people think of when they're going to get hypnotized uh and that you take them down deep enough and they kind of start enjoying it and it's almost like peeling back uh you know the layers of an onion where they start going back to certain memories and they start experiencing it and then they they themselves realize man that memory i know is real other not not specifically the one that you're trying to recover but other things let's say an age regression okay and when they start realizing man i do know this thing inside my subconscious mind these memories are there i just don't recall them then you can gradually take them back to that point in time if that's what you're looking to do uh as far as uh for them to give you more details or sometimes the, the entire event because sometimes people block things out like they have like this little hole of either uh, minutes hours of, of an event where they could they could be walking around and say i don't remember they really consciously don't remember you know so yeah no that that uh, it's it's really funny because one time um i got a call from this gentleman um that he lived down in key west and he tells me he calls me up and he goes well can you hypnotize somebody so that they can remember something and i said well yeah uh, but it depends if they really if is it their real memory like i can't you know if it if it's not part of their subconscious mind or they didn't experience it i can't make you remember something you never experienced and i'm like this is weird i said well, why and, and he's telling me no because um i put away x amount of money in my house and uh it's disappeared and uh i asked my wife and she's just saying that she doesn't remember where i put it so i'm going to take her up to miami and i want you to hypnotize her maybe she can remember where it went <laughs> she was basically he was going <laughs> to use me to strong arm this lady his wife <laughs> and uh he made the appointment and i guess he was like trying to like uh scare her into it and like uh maybe the when i was confirming the appointment he was like no we're not gonna go and i he just basically used the uh, i'm gonna get you hypnotized and we're gonna find out where the money is uh but yeah people people it's be surprising mostly i used to believe it or not a lot of times for the memory recall for people taking exams and you know people that have a hard time when they're under stress and things like that but yeah this very interesting and also I did a lot of past life regression which is a whole nother show but anyway um let me ask you uh when people um and I'm sure have have you ever had with people especially those reluctant ones who are kind of dismissive of the experience but then when they have somebody interviewing them that they know is not going to make fun of them is actually listening to them with an open mind where they kind of like start giving you more details that maybe they haven't spoken to anybody about yes absolutely yeah um it, it, people will uh, will talk to me about things and and uh, then they might meet my wife a year later and, and they'll bring it up okay and my wife's like yeah i don't know what you're talking about they're like he didn't tell you and she's like yeah well, i was like dude i don't tell anybody yes anything that yeah. they don't want it to go out you know and and you know there's that thing is is when somebody goes look I, I don't want you to tell anybody but this is what happened but yes, they really kind of so. want you to tell some people <laughs> but they, you, know, oh, but you know what yeah it's, I, it's 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 surprising sometimes what people will keep to themselves sometimes for years <laughs> right yeah uh, especially so, if you have uh, a if, job if that say you I think, don't, I'm sorry go ahead no if they say that they don't you know they they want to keep it confidential then it will absolutely be confidential with me mm -hmm. and that let me tell you something yeah. that people don't realize unless you've been doing this for a long time 
how important that is. If you're yeah. serious about doing this type of work, wherever it oh, leads, yeah. okay, wherever it leads, you know, whether it's, hey, you know, you've got nothing supernatural except your family needs to go to therapy or, uh, or whatever the case might be. Uh, confidentiality, uh, I think is nowadays, especially uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, for serious investigations, once you develop a reputation for it, it's invaluable. Right. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and if you lose that, I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. there's plenty of people out there that, you know, just take everything and, and what people say. And it's like, you know, part of your job is, is not just to listen to these people and say, oh, well, let me investigate what this is. Part of your job is also to help them make sense yes. of what they're experiencing. So, right. Yeah. Right. And yeah, the, you know, that's why I'm, like I was saying at the beginning, Greg, as far as um, I love that you're treating the invest paranormal investigations with the same discipline that you would give to a regular investigation. Okay, even though right. I know it's the outcome sometimes might be very difficult to come to a conclusion on in a way, I guess. Uh, but still, if you're really, really, truly serious about this, not, and not after the sensationalism that we see attached to it, unfortunately, right? I can see we're having this model to work within for anybody, and that's another thing. Uh, you know, I tell you know people that that are interested in doing it, and I tell them, look, besides getting together with a reputable group, et cetera, et cetera, and yeah, you could read books, which is very important, but you need to do the field work as far as, and I'm sure you've experienced it as an investigator, you know, outside of the paranormal field, that there's something that you learned when you implement what you read of in a book. Because people, for sure. example, interviewing a person, it's like, God, that could go a million ways. Yep, and, and it, the interesting thing is, is, is I have friends of mine that have never worked as an investigator in any facet. Mm -hmm. but they love reading mystery novels. They love reading true detective novels yeah. and stuff like that. And they watch some TV and stuff and they can come out and they have great investigative skills because they're basing it on whatever the book they read or, or, you know, the, the story. Um, and the interesting thing is, is, is they can do great things, but right. without having the field work, and not having a lot of experience in the field work, it's so funny the mistakes that they'll make because they're so, yeah. you know, they're, they're so elementary mistakes that it's like, yeah, you know, um, it's not Sherlock Holmes. It's, it's not uh, Edgar Allan Poe. It's not, yes. uh, you know, a, a, any of these traditional mystery type investigations. It's not like that. It's more true you know, hard boiled crime kind of stuff. Cake, mm -hmm. uh, Scarpetta, um, I forget what the, the author or she's, right. uh, yes. anyway, you know, it's, 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 we don't always have the right answer and we don't always set the world back on its axis the way it's supposed to be. Sometimes we just experience something and just go, I don't know what the hell that was. <laughs> you know, just, and, the, and, and that's into your investigation. I don't know, you know, cause it, uh, our job as investigators is to try to determine what happened, you know, uh, and, and try to determine, you know, what is, what is the relevance of what we found so in, a, in a basic investigation, you're going to, uh, let's say it's a crime investigation. It's either going to be founded, unfounded, or undetermined, right? Mm -hmm. Either, you either uh, go, okay, I have the probable cause to say that this person committed burglary, or I do not have the probable cause to say this person committed a burglary, or I don't know if I have, you know, the, the information for probable cause for this burglary. So it's, you know, it's either founded, unfounded, or undetermined. And all this information can be very, very confusing because um, it could be relevant information that is related 
to the event that you're investigating. But you could also be there investigating an event and and discover some relevant information, but that relevant information is not related to what you're there to to begin with. In other mm-hmm. words, uh, like uh, uh, at Waverly, um, you know that there's orbs they see there all the time. So you go there to look for orbs, and while you're taking pictures of orbs, you see you know, the movement of a shadow person. Right. Okay, well, that's relevant, but it's unrelated to why you're there. Exactly. You know, you're there for the orbs, and all of a sudden you see this other thing. Uh, or the whole thing is not related at all. For instance, uh, you have uh, your EMF reader sitting there, and you're asking it questions kind of the way you do a magic eight ball <laughs> or something right. else. And, uh, you know, it keeps going green. You know, is anybody here? And it goes green. Uh, you know, are you a man or a woman? And it goes green. And, you know, uh, were you killed here? And it goes green or whatever. It's like, oh, my God, that's amazing. No, turn your phone off. <laughs> you, you're, yeah. you put your phone on airplane mode because your phone is kicking out its GPS coordinates and it's setting off your EMF reader. I've seen that. And people don't so realize how EMF re- can, can, a lot of different things can produce EMF readings. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, a lot of things. And one of the things, and I'm, I'm, I have, every time I try to go to Waverly, somehow I get detoured. But one of the things that I point out to people, because you know that a lot of these places, they'll say, well, and I'm not saying exclusively Waverly, lots of places, especially tuberculosis, whole thousands of people died. And what I point right. out to people is when you were back then, of course, where, you know, there was no cure for TB. When you were basically consigned to go to these hospitals, you kind of knew that there was a very good chance that you were going to die. <laughs> you know, I hate to right. say it, but sure. in other words, as far as making your peace and thinking, chances are I'm going to meet my maker soon. You know, so the, 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 uh, I think a lot of times uh, the spiritual turbulence that you get at some of these places, not necessarily because they have a high amount of deaths, depends on the circumstances. Asylums, that's a whole different thing. You know, insane asylums, that's that that right there. That's that definitely is a hotbed. Forget that. But these TB hospitals, people kind of knew you understood that your chances of survival were slim to none. And uh, the, the fact that so many people died, it was like. It just happened. You knew, as a matter of fact, for for lack of a better, you were kind of in a way prepared. To to die. You right. Know? So. Yeah. Um, and I have my old theory sometimes about, uh, non-human entities that become attached to places like that though, because of not the deaths, but because of the level of suffering. Okay. Right. That sometimes you see connected to a lot of these places and, uh, and I know that sometimes they say, oh, you know, some of the things that they were doing to try to cure tuberculosis, when we look back at them now, they were like, God, that was horrible. But I think that when at that time, those doctors were really trying to help the TB victims. They just were trying to figure it out. I mean, their their aim was not to torture patients. It was just, well, let's see if this works. You know, like I understand taking out ribs and things like that. And um, in my own experience, I've seen certain levels of what are called non-human entities that usually you will see connected to places like asylums or places like Waverly that are as a result of suffering suffering of let's say people sometimes that were there for months or whatever i don't know depending i guess how far advanced your tb was uh you know that or knowing let's say for example uh that you were leaving a family behind especially if you were a younger person you know, so but that's a whole nother show okay but anyway um the uh, uh do you explain it in your and the book greg what happened or how to handle when you do find let's say you're you've gone through the investigation you're going through your interview and you're gathering you know from whether it was one person or multiple people that you realize this is not for real that you basically tell this person you're this is this either you, there's nothing supernatural or you know there's nothing supernatural and you're feeding me a load of bull because that happens nowadays yeah um 
I kind of, I, I, I don't know. There's, there's a book called Blink uh-huh. uh, by, I think it's Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. And it, the whole book's premise is why, what, what is it about human beings that we can make a decision in the blink of an eye? Okay. Um, a lot of times those, those decisions are wrong decisions. But when we do make a, a decision really quickly based on no evidence, no interaction or anything, you, let's say you look at something and you go, yeah, that's not real. Uh, he gives examples of uh, art dealers that walk in and go, wow, that's, that statue is not real. But, man, it looks so good. And they do their investigation, and it supports the fact that the statue is real and it was in antiquity and they spend 20 million dollars to put it in the museum and then six months later find out that some guy in new jersey was the one that had, you know and made it look old it up and, <laughs> yeah made it look old yeah and it's like why what was the deal when i walked in and i when i first saw it i knew it was a fake but then i went ahead and conducted my investigation and you know, I came up with the idea that it's not a fake. It's you know, it's 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 real. Um, seems like the more experience you have as an investigator, uh, you will lay you will lay one way or the other. In other words, if you're a really gullible person and you're you're just running around believing in everything, well, you get better and better at believing in everything. So you know, it it it, it just gets more and more benign what you're doing. Um, individual that's more and more critical can become cynical. So you have to kind of manage yourself somewhere in the middle and try to maintain, you know, objective skepticism and and judge it the best you can on, you know, your evidence. But I will fall back on the blink thing again. Sometimes I'll talk to somebody and I'm like, yeah, there's something about this person. They're being deceptive right away. I'm not sure what it was. I wasn't. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know whether they didn't make eye contact or they made too much eye contact or they, uh, you know, they were sitting with their legs crossed or yeah, it, it's something. Yeah, their body language was a them. little bit off. Yeah. Yeah. There's something going on or the inflection of their voice or or something is 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 off. And so, you know, right away, I'll, I'll kind of pick up on that. Typically, I will try to cur- curtail my interview with this person as quickly as I can and not waste my time. And no one likes confrontation. Well, some people like confrontation, I guess. But most healthy people don't like, right. you know, intense confrontation. And, and believe it or not, most cops don't like intense conf- confrontation. They may be good at it, but they don't you know, go out there and really dig it. So I try to cut it off and bail as quickly as I can sure. when I think somebody is full of crap. Um, on the other side, if a person is trying to hoax other individuals and defraud people of their money, like saying there's a place that's haunted and then they, they do some things to make it seem like it's haunted, um, that's defrauding people. If you want to have a haunted house, that's fine. Sure. In other words, like a Halloween haunted house. You want to do that and have ghosts in it and all that stuff. But if you're selling your property as a haunted location right? Uh, and you're accepting money for people to come in and rent it, uh, you better not have put anything in the walls or make noises intentionally or anything like that because that is defrauding people of, of their money. And I will call you out on that. And I will, I will uh, you know, uh, be aggressive in that manner because I don't want to see anybody be defrauded of things. Of course not. Of so course anyway. not. Yeah, and I'm not going to say, and but I've done research on a couple of properties that are being used the way you described. Yeah. And uh, I'm a pretty good researcher. Yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll, I mean, I know that some things, some like I said before, aren't documented, especially if they were nefarious, for lack of a better word. But you come right. and you realize, man, this is all made up. <laughs> but it's okay, you know. But it uh, makes a good yarn, uh, especially if yeah. you're going to be charging uh, a team to go in there, let's say for the weekend. 
and experience something or, you know, get some type of you know, whatever, you know, something to, right. to get that. And it's like, okay, all right. Well, mm, I'm not going to, you know, I, I leave it at that. But yeah, uh, I, I know that. And also the reason why I'm saying is that, uh, you know, in some investigations, it was the uh, uh, oh hurry uh, we're scared and then when you get there you realize that these people were like we're not really scared we're we just want you to confirm for us there's ghosts and what are their names because we're so thrilled we're we've got ghosts and it's like are you kidding me <laughs> you know and right. then of course you realize either 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 there's nothing there and they're you know like you said they're making you know there's a there's a pigeon that's stuck in your attic and now you think that's it's haunted because it sounds like you know, you think you're going to get the next reality show uh, filming in your house. Or uh, sometimes there's people out there, unfortunately, with some mental issues that they take it in that direction, unfortunately, when there's nothing, right. absolutely nothing paranormal, supernatural taking place. Nope. And I'm sure you run across oh. a lot of a lot of people like that out there. I mean, and when I... In, when I'm uh, when I describe that, I don't I, I I'm I'm give people a lot of leeway for being eccentric and peculiar. You know, I think in a way sure. it makes the world more yeah. interesting. But there's a few people running out there that I say are pretending to be normal. If you know <laughs> that that sometimes I've run across them and I'm like, uh, you know what? There, you're. There's no haunting taking place, and the only thing that's that's haunted, I guess, is your mind, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I've run across a couple like that, unfortunately. That and 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 they believe it. Like I said, their pers that their perception is their reality, and they truly believe it. And when you do tell them something along the lines of, "Hey, I don't think uh, that what your experience is is paranormal in origin," or "Look, I found this that might be causing that noise," they they kind of get offended with, yep. with your conclusion. So, yeah. That's, that's a fact. That's true. I've seen stuff like that. Yeah. So, Greg, let me ask you, now that you're, uh, this book that's coming out, are you planning anything else, fiction, nonfiction, anything in the works for uh, 2019? Yeah, there's going to be, um, uh, I have a couple of books. I, I can't really share oh, I, I with understand. you because I'm afraid. I understand. I, I'm a, I'm, no, I, I'm I'm just afraid that if I if I give it away, it's a it's a really good idea. And okay. Somebody could pick it up and and, and yeah. get a book out quicker than I can, you know. Yeah. Um, no, I but yeah, I have a couple. I've I, I, I've gotten interested in specific cases. You know, the books that I've written uh, in the past, uh, the the nonfiction. I mm -hmm. I give a a lot of different case right. um, studies, I guess, in there. And I'm like, you know what? I, I think I'd really, I, there's, there's a few things that I've investigated that I've investigated for years. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to put them all together and I'm going to, I'm going to put out a, a couple of books that are specifically just one particular investigation from beginning to end. Um, and I, I, th those types of books do really well. You yeah, know? Well, so I, I'm going to. Th the second book that I wrote, ahead. I wrote it based on the research that I did. Uh, I, I mean, I, I titled it, you know, The Lady in the Blue Kimono Film Noir Murders because they took place usually between the 1920s to the 1940s, you know, right before when the film noir thing was going on. And uh -huh. I, I based it just on research that I came across on other cases of actual murders that took place. And surprisingly, uh, so many things, they were pretty horrific. You know, you know, you always hear of certain, like, let's say the Balak Dahlia and things like this, which were horrific and of course all the attention it got but there were a lot of horrific murders that happened around that time just as bad that they never got solved uh, and they just basically made a blip on the headlines for maybe a couple of weeks or a month depending if there was anybody arrested and that that was it yeah. Uh, but yeah people and a lot of uh, unidentified you know, and of course, back then, forensics is not like what we have now with DNA and all this other stuff. But still, uh, and uh, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out there. One of the things I came across was that if the victim, whether it was a man or a woman, but in this case, uh, 
the book that I did most, even though there were some men victims, most of them were women. If she lived some type of risky lifestyle, and by this I don't necessarily mean prostitution, but anything where ba back in the morals of the day, 20s, 30s, and 40s, she wasn't on the up and up. Mm, things, basically, they were, murders like this were put on the pile of, uh, well, hey, you know what, it could have been anybody. And unless it yeah, became we call, like a... We call, those, we call those misdemeanor murders. Right, yeah. You know, it's like, it was a prostitute, and, and there are times when law enforcement doesn't, yeah, not, not particularly uh, now, I think, be, because they have mechanisms in place that will make sure that a proper investigation is done, but in the past, you know, they just look, ah, it's a couple of drug dealers killed each other, who cares? Right, yeah. Yeah, nobody cares. Nobody. It's like, okay, so, wow, who's our suspect? Well, uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Who could have motive? Uh, well, we got a multitude of people. And, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, like in one of the cases, the it was really strange. The lady, she, um, this was, I want to say, back in the 1940s, they, I want to say, was it Kentucky or Arkansas? I'm sorry. And basically they found her body they it was one of those mine shafts that had drained out and they found her she had had a block tied around her ankles and she was thrown in there and um eventually they found out who she was even though they were rich you know they they had a hard time but they identified her uh because back in you know world war ii you would give your fingerprint if you worked at any of the factories here in the united states that had to do with the you know whether it was uh building the planes or anything so eventually they based on her fingerprint, they were able to ID her. And um, apparently this lady had been married, I want to say like 10 or 11 times. And even though that's not prostitution, back in the morals of that day, and that basically they came to the conclusion that it was probably her last husband uh, that killed her and dumped her body in that mine, you know, when it was uh, that mine shaft, when it was full of water. And it never went anywhere. It never went anywhere. And yeah. I saw that a lot. It was like, it was like, oh, okay, you know, you were kind of a floozy lady, so, oh well. And it just one of those things where the prosecutor, you know, they changed offices and it just went away, and the guy just lived out his life. Yep. Well into his eighties. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. Of, what is it? It's, uh, you know, it's uh, the, 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 there's no so people would be surprised how how many. Um, you know, reality is stranger than fiction, much more than people think. But anyway, Greg, thank you so much for spending this time tonight. It has been wonderful to speak to you. Um, I know you, because I had I had the cover of the book with a prior uh, title on it, but um, I'm going to have a link to your website on the credits of the okay. show. And uh, I'm sure people can go from there and find places uh, where they can purchase it, et cetera. Is that correct? Plus any of your other books? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll send you a, a copy of the new cover uh, of the, the one that I've been working on and should be out next month oh, okay. called Becoming a Paranormal Detective. Uh, it, and it's, uh, it's uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley kind of guided me on it yeah. a little bit as far as, as far as that goes. I'm but, telling yeah, you, the, the, um, that there's a lot of, of what I say, that's going to be the book for the hardcore investigators. This is not for the wannabe weekenders or legend trippers. This is for the hardcore right. ones, which is those are the people that are going to really use this book. And I'm really happy to see somebody wrote it. So congratulations and uh, good luck on your new projects. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was wonderful talking to you with you also. Likewise. Take care, Greg. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, bye. So guys, hmm, see, <laughs> I know there's some of you going, hey, I'm a legend tripper. What are you talking about, Marlene? I take the paranormal seriously. Okay, I you do. Look, <clears throat> let me explain something to you. I'm the first one that I think legend tripping is a blast, okay? Because let's face it, you know, it's interesting if you're gonna go on vacation or you go to these places and there's a story, uh, about a haunting or that you see some, I, I think that's fantastic. I, 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 and I think that, you know, a lot of people, they mix everything. They go on vacation and they go to a certain hotel and they go, 
I think that's fantastic. And as a matter of fact, a lot of legend trippers accidentally witness paranormal events. You know, it's funny. You could have a slew of paranormal investigators or teens march or go to a certain place and they don't get nothing or they get stuff that's real. Ah. And then you get a legend trippers just hanging out, having a good time. And they get a full blown event, hit them in the face. Okay. But again, when that happens to you and you're a legend tripper, this has to do with almost like the accidental event, which by the way, a lot of people have that. What Greg is um, describing in his book is for what I call my hardcore investigators. And everybody goes, Marlene, what's a hardcore? Hardcore investigators are exactly what he was describing. These are the investigators which have a very high threshold for accepting things as truly paranormal. Truly, truly. And even when they gather evidence that's kind of like, eh, they'll put it aside and say, you know what? Could be, but it just does not reach that level where I can conclude this is absolutely paranormal or supernatural in origin. And they shelve it. In other words, and, and, and that's the thing. A lot of investigators, they take a little thing and they'll say, yeah, 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 yeah. It's paranormal. It's supernatural. Well, did you hear that? Or did you see that? And it's like, no, that that's, that's like, not really. That's really vague or really, that could be anything. And they want to throw it into the paranormal, under the paranormal column. And the hardcore investigator does not do that. On the contrary, to have something be identified Whatever it is, uh, a photograph, an EVP, an audio, uh, anything, anything, anything to be considered truly paranormal or to be, it, I mean, it has, I myself, and I've said it before, I'm a, I'm a skeptic. I'm a skeptic. Why? Because first of all, I have experienced true things. Okay. Which in my mind, it's like, I know, I know what I felt seen. It's uh and when you're truly involved in this work as a hardcore investigator you don't want anything but the premium validation the premium evidence okay to substantiate the claim of whatever it is that you're investigating whether you're going to a historical location let's say like gettysburg or if you're doing a residential investigation or which, by the way, that's another thing. Let's say you go to a Gettysburg. Do you understand? I, I, and I'm sure a lot of people have been to Gettysburg. Gettysburg. It's huge. When you're talking an area to cover, as far as an invest, you know, like capturing evidence, for example, that's like, it's, you've got, it's huge. Um, that's so different from a residence or from a, a, a place that's supposed to be haunted, but it's a house. Yeah, it might be a couple of thousand square feet or 3,000 square feet if, if it's a larger area, but a, 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 an outdoor location, you've got so many ambient noise to deal with. If you're there in a busy season, you've got other tourists running around. I mean, <laughs> it's like, forget it. You know, a lot of the things that you could, you could use in a regular investigation, you can't use it. You can't. Because you know it's going to get contaminated, or there's a very good chance it'll be contaminated. So again, that's why I'm saying the level of what you consider acceptable evidence, you have to have a very high threshold. Again, and this is for the person that's not looking for sensationalism, which is a big attractant. Okay. And like I said, usually when people do that, there's two reasons, money or ego involved in it. Okay, unless what you really want is the proof. Something in you to be satisfied knowing, like, like hopefully you don't lie to yourself. You know, you can try lying to yourself, but you know what they say, everywhere you go, there you are. That you understand, you know what, whatever this is, this is real. This is real. Uh, and of course, by the time you get there, you've gone through a checklist of possible, probable things that could have caused it, that are the source for it. And then this has a lot to do, again, 
how honest you are with yourself and what is it that you're seeking. Do you want the truth or do you want sensationalism? Okay. Or are you trying to stroke your own ego? And then, which is why a lot of people will lie to themselves. But even then you're lying to yourself and you know, you're lying to yourself or you're saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to take, for example, this EVP recording and I'm going to, did you hear it said, uh, so-and-so or the name It's like, come on, don't do that. Don't do that. But again, this is for the person that seriously, even if, which is a lot of paranormal investigators, they do this part time because they've got regular lives. They've got regular jobs. They, they work for a living. Okay. But the ones I'm telling you in my experience, and I've been doing this for, I want to say it's almost pretty soon going to be 30 years. The people that are the ones that stick to it are the ones that have that standard when it comes to investigations and proof and having that, that when, you know, when the, what he's describing as far in his, in his book, you know, all these like a, basically like a structure of what you, what you follow in order of how to conduct these investigations. Well, guess what? This is how the person that's serious about it, they don't mind. They'll read the book and they'll go, hmm. A person that's very frivolous will go, oh my God, you mean I'm going to have to do that and that? No, forget that. No. And, you know, they'll interview somebody and they'll take them out their word. Yeah, because all they're trying to do is construct. In other words, this place is going to be haunted. <clears throat> At the end, I can tell you it's already haunted. And you're like, and I will fill in the blanks to reach the, it's haunted. Okay. And that's not your hardcore investigator. And usually those people stick around for maybe a few months, a year, two years, the most. Unless they happen to have a reality show. It's not part of you. But the, us everyday investigators, the real and paranormal investigators, I call us real paranormal investigators. These are the people that they'd rather say, no, it's not. Or even if there is, it's, there's not sufficient evidence to come to that conclusion or at the very least be mm, rather than rush to the conclusion that there is. So what happens is that <clears throat> eventually you yourself know, in other words, your under your list of true hauntings, it'll be very short. Depending of course of how many investigations you do. And then in the ones that are, Definitely not. You have a long list. And then the ones that are inconclusive, could be, couldn't be, but there's just too many holes in there. Maybe you'll have a middle list, you know, where you say, yeah, there's certain things here, but there's other things missing here. So we'll just put it impossible. Sometimes things like that fall into residual hauntings. You know, you've got a haunting that, and it only happens every once in a while, certain times of the year, sometimes uh, in the presence only of certain people. And then it'll stop for weeks, months, even years. And then for some reason, it'll start up again. Sometimes for reasons unknown. Other times, like a lot of people say, if they do construction or something's going on, even the emotional state of the people living in the structure will have to do with um, basically stirring up even residual hauntings. Okay, it's almost like the heightened emotions of the humans. It's like it's, it almost acts like a supercharged battery for having like like the projector turn on. You know, and uh, have this these events, whether it's footsteps on the stairs, smells, uh, just certain things. Uh, I mean, I've heard of residual hauntings where people will clearly hear a car drive up into the driveway, come up the driveway, park. They'll hear the crunch of gravel of the tires and in some cases even hear footsteps. Then nobody enters and it's and it's residual. 
There's no intelligence. It's residual. That that's how definitive it is. And um, there could be a lot of triggers for stuff like that. A lot of triggers, and we put up, we put out a lot of kinetic energy. Uh, and I hate to say it, but usually it's when humans are distressed or emotional that that happens. You're angry, sad, and or sad. Uh, you know, depending. A lot of these things, that, that's why a lot, a lot of times poltergeist cases have a teenager um, living in the household. Because, let's face it, when you're a teenager, you're... Your emotions swing around. And if your home life is a little bit unsettled, that's it. Woo! You're on a pendulum. Uh, you could have a lot of internal battles going on mentally. And that's why sometimes you have these poltergeist cases that will last sometimes weeks, months, and then totally stop. And really it's a manifestation of PK activity from that person which a lot of things are going on sometimes that they don't realize because a lot of times the agent of a poltergeist case, let's say that teenager has no idea that they're producing it. And sometimes they're the ones that are the target. They target, and you think they're targeting themselves. Uh, yeah. And again, it, I mean, we could, there's a psychological profile for that as to why that could happen. But yeah, I mean, the paranormal and, and a lot of people like like what he was saying oh you're gonna raid on the paranormal parade marlene by by being a skeptic or like he said like a cynic or uh you know oh, everything's gonna be discounted uh no i don't say it and i didn't hear greg say hey the supernatural the paranormal doesn't exist never he didn't say it i didn't say it on the contrary i truly believe it does very much so However, I do think it's much more subtle than people believe sometimes because we've been kind of like um, programmed to think that sometimes supernatural events have to be like in your face or something that can be captured. Sometimes I think there's certain things that, that are going on on a paranormal level that sometimes are very, very subtle. Okay. Uh, but again especially something that's anchored to a certain place. And uh, we're talking, let's say, an intelligent haunting. Like I said, our perception is our reality. You know, sometimes people, like I said, you know, uh, uh, when you hear all these stories, oh, because uh, there were three deaths in the house. I was like, okay, well, you know what? About 100 years ago, less or more or less, even less, People would have babies at home. People would die at home. And people would even have wakes at home. This was the norm. This was not like, oh, scary, scary. You died at home and you had a wake in the house. No, this was pretty common. This was not unusual. Okay, especially, uh, and, uh, especially if you were ill, you had an illness, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times if you had an elderly, you know, grandparent or elderly relative, it's not like now that they go off to these nursing homes a lot of times, you know, especially when, uh, let's say housewives, you know, the, the, in other words, that there was a family member at home, these people were living at their family's house and they would pass away at home. And this was the norm. There was nothing creepy about it. This was just the way it was. Uh, so when a lot of people say, oh, because they had so many deaths, it was like, okay, but what kind of deaths? People died of old age. People died of illnesses. They passed away at home. Mm, yeah. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be haunted. doesn't mean they're going to become a ghost. You know, not at all. Yeah, that sometimes, yeah, sometimes things happen. People, you know, suicides or tragic or unexpected deaths, of course. And like I said, uh, a lot of times, depending if you lived in a more rural area or even, you know, let's say, you know, now we're so used to dialing 911 for an emergency. 
40, 50, 60 years ago, it was not like now that you call 911 and within what minutes, depending on where you live, you're going to have paramedics that are trained to uh, save you, resuscitate you, give you medicine, and by the way, and talk to the doctor in the emergency room? No. In the 70s, you got an ambulance who all they would do was put you on a gurney and take you to the hospital. But they weren't there to give you medicine or resuscitate you or... No, they were getting paid to get you to help ASAP. And then before that, people would die uh, from a lot of things that uh, people don't die of now because help is right away. There's medicine, there's cures, there's treatment. Uh, now we're very good at handling traumatic injuries. Back then, people would die from snake bite. People would fall off a ladder and get killed. People would get an infection because they took a cut. They didn't cleanse it well or keep it well. Before you know it, they got poison and you know blood poisoning. They would kill them. Something simple could kill you. Um, so it's kind of weird as far as people dying and why you know certain places get the reputation for being haunted because a certain amount of people died. Well, how old is this place? that kind of thing so I mean it's it's that's why it's really really good to do your research and your investigation depending on what it is that you're presented with when you're doing the case and I think that the only ones that are going to really be interested in doing this is going to be the person that is really serious whether they're working with a team or whether they just want to know for themselves hey, you know what, this thing with the afterlife or what happens, uh, is there such a thing as ghosts? Are there places that are really haunted? You know, like really, really, truly? I want to know. And I'm willing to put in the time because sometimes it can be very time consuming, especially when you're doing research, historical research on a property or on an event, things like that, that it's like it it can eat up your time. Believe me, if you're not serious about it, it it, it it fades real quick, you know, uh, then, you know, the truth is don't call yourself a paranormal investigator. There, I've said it. <laughs> you know, call yourself a ghost hunter, like he said, or a legend tripper. Nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with those things. But um, considering the subject matter, which is poo-pooed too often, um, there's nothing wrong even though, um, and saying that there are certain things you can be frivolous about, considering, like, I, and I've said this before, that considering the subject matter that basically you're dealing with dead people or the spirits of dead people, and if you get too carried away, that that's a bad thing too. But at the same time, you also have to have some level of seriousness about what you're doing. That is, if that's if you really, really want to get the proof or that moment maybe where you go I, I, I know it's real I, I even if nobody believes me even if I, I can't produce proof I know this really exists and for some people it's because they've never had an experience before and they want to have a genuine experience or there's people that have had an experience maybe as a kid and they want to repeat it, they, but as an adult, they want to understand it. Like, when I was a kid, this happened to me. And I, I, I know what I saw or what I felt or whatever. And, but I want to, I want to repeat that. I, I want to have that, but as an adult, so I can kind of grapple with it and confirm, hey, this, there's something to us humans, to our souls, to our spirits after we die, what happens? Uh, is there such a thing as uh, people's spirit being a, becoming earthbound uh, or places that are haunted or even residual stuff, which there's no intelligence behind it. Just people that just they want to have that confirmation based on maybe one earlier experience they had. And unfortunately, also, there's people that this is how they deal with the death of a loved one, that they want to soothe their souls especially if it was an untimely death for the person they loved, that this person that they 
do continue to exist, that their souls continue to exist and are in a better place. You know? So yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff about the paranormal, believe me. Despite having high standards, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. So, for those hardcore investigators, go get them, tiger. Anyway, guys, thanks for being part of my audience. You're all wonderful. Make sure to visit MiamiGhostChronicles.com. There you can submit your True Believer stories. Uh, you can see uh, links from my books. You can also... Um, you know, see information about the podcast series I have, Nightshade Diary, Supernatural Storytime, which are the stories that I've gathered throughout the years that people would send to me. Uh, some of them, and, and some of them I've been told, I've been to places like what Greg was saying, that people will tell you stuff, and some of them I actually wrote down. Um, I also put information there if I've got any uh, merchandise giveaways on social media and uh just about anything exciting coming up also if i'm going to be doing any uh talk show appearances i'll, I'll be there too uh, i'll post it on there if you guys want to um you know download the mp3 file or just listen to it whatever the case might be bottom line thank you so very very much for spending this time with me take care you're all wonderful